Thank you for joining. In this lesson, we will continue practicing routes, and we will see how constraints work in ASP.NET Core 7. If you remember, we have completed the previous lesson on route templates. Route templates are closely connected with constraints. Both are registered using interpolation and can be used to restrict the values that can be used in a route parameter. Route templates do not restrict values and can accept any value. Therefore, route templates are used to define the structure of a route, while constraints are used to define the requirements that must be met by the value of a route parameter. For example, you could use a route constraint to ensure that a parameter is a number, or that it is a value that exists in a database or if an NML is of a valid type. So, in general, we verify that a route is used with valid values only. But this will help you prevent incorrect data entry, improve performance, enhance security, and so on. Constraints are declared using a colon after the route parameter. On the diagram, everything is pretty straightforward. We have a constraint with a decision point that verifies if the value is of an in type. If it is, then we process the required logic and send a successful response. Otherwise, we can take custom actions using a custom rejection handler. Or the rejection part can be branched and the user will be redirected to another page. So, once again, you are the creator. And one more thing to mention is that constraints are not about data types like float and so on. Constraints do not support some types of data. So, specific data types are not valid to be used with constraints. And this is the list of constraints available in NetCore 7. This list is not exhaustive, so you can select, a, let's say, alpha, which provides a constraint for a string that must consist of alphabetical characters and be case sensitive. Another option is GUID, which represents a globally unique identifier. You can obtain a GUID directly in Visual Studio from the Tools menu by generating a GUID. Or there is a required constraint that is handy for enforcing the presence of a non-parameter value during URL generation, and so on. Now let's practice. Here is the code where we left off in the previous lesson. I will delete all unnecessary parts except for the run method and the map method. The run method will be used as an indicator that the map method with constraint was not triggered. Also, let's disable these green squiggles. Go to Tools, then Options, type Squiggles in the search bar, and temporarily uncheck them. Just to mention, the green squiggles complain about the usage of using points. The correct way to use this code will be without the using points method. Additionally, this warning in the error list is related to the current usage of the using points method. We will learn how to use it correctly and eliminate the warning in future lessons. For now, let's focus on constraints. And again, to mention, in the previous lesson, the message of the run method was incorrect. It's not about the post request, but just a run method. I will change the string to constraint was not triggered. So, it will indicate that a constraint hasn't worked. I will also change the constraint to be of type int value. So, at this endpoint should be triggered only if the value is an integer. Now, let's hit the URL in the browser. As you can see, with an integer value, the endpoint has passed the test. Now, let's try with a string and observe the trigger run method since we are not in compliance with the constraint requirements. Additionally, the boolean constraint will work in exactly the same way. If true or false is provided as a part of the URL, then the assigned method will be triggered accordingly. The next example will involve the GUID or Globally Unique Identifier data type. As mentioned earlier, a GUID can be generated using Visual Studio. You can open tools and generate a GUID. It stores a 16 bytes binary value. Let's consider a network of computers where each computer is assigned its own GUID stored in a database as a primary key for database tables. This enables us to retrieve required data. The endpoint name will be clients, and the expected constraint type for the endpoint will be GUID. This type will be recognized by C Sharp automatically. 
and then we store the value into a variable. I will adjust the endpoint path and paste the GUID, removing the color braces or any other symbols if that's the case. If we hit the endpoint with a valid GUID, we will receive a successful reply. And next example will be with the time constraint. I will amend the code quickly. And if we enter the correct date, the endpoint will be triggered accordingly. However, in the case where the date is incorrect, let's say the date is 99, the endpoint will not be triggered. As you can see, the constraint is captured correctly by the server and the date format is verified. Next, let's practice with a quite important constraint, which is a length. Since constraints can be combined, we can restrict both the minimum and maximum length. Additionally, we can add an additional default parameter in case no data is received. The default parameter is guest. The endpoint will be client IDs, and the ID must have a length of not less than 6 digits and a maximum of 10 digits. The URL can include hyphens to separate words and construct a simple, understandable sentence. Additionally, we can include a default value, which is guest. If I enter the URL using six numbers, the URL will respond accordingly. However, if I use six alphabetical characters, the URL will not be triggered, due to the constraint type being int. Furthermore, the default value guest will also not be triggered because of the constraint type being int in this case. Now let's change the default value to six zeros. We need to keep the URL clear after client IDs, and we will get the default value of zeros. Additionally, if the URL contains a combination of numbers and characters, the URL will also not be triggered. Both min length and max length are great if we need to use only one of these constraints. If we use both, then the construction becomes cumbersome. This is where the single word length comes in handy. Additionally, length can contain two values, representing both the minimum and maximum lengths, or it can be a single parameter indicating a fixed quantity of numbers. So let's make it shorter with the length constraint. And the endpoint has replied. And if we only want an alphabetical value, we have a constraint named alpha. So we can combine the length with alpha. And in this case, the only accepted user's ID will be an alphabetical value. The default value needs to be in accordance with the constraints as well. If I remove any parameters after IDs, then we get the default value. However, if I add a parameter, then the response will provide the correct output. Alpha is case sensitive, and if case sensitivity needs to be cancelled, then the ignore case cancellation option can be added. If I remove the second parameter, the endpoint will be triggered only if the URL parameter consists of six symbols. So if I enter more or fewer than the permitted quantity of characters, and the run method is triggered. For numbers, we can also use min and max constraints. Min and max are about the values themselves and not about the length. Permitted numbers will be between 6 and 10, and the default value needs to be in accordance with the constraint as well, falling within the range of 6 and 10, otherwise it will not be triggered. Alternatively, there is a shortcut for the min and max constraints called range. It's similar to length, so min and max can be simplified to range, meaning only the numbers in the range of 6 and 10 are permitted. Now let's see a constraint using regular expressions. Regex is available in many programming languages, and it's a convenient way to use it with constraints. With a single string, you can declare a predefined range of required parameters. Let's imagine we send a string to the backend to find a user's ID within a specific data range in a database. Then we can limit our options to specific values, make it a handy way to control the required parameters the endpoint should handle using regex. And if I enter 2025, we get a mismatch, and the run method is triggered. In order to validate values, it's generally recommended not to rely solely on constraints, but to also leverage the programming language itself or combine these possibilities. For instance, we can use an if statement to confirm if the received URL encoded value is correct. 
ensuring there is no tampering with our front-end form. If the value is correct, we can permit a specific action, otherwise we block it. However, if we continue in the same manner using a single file, the code will significantly increase, leading to reduced readability. Therefore, splitting it into separate parts would be prudent. In the next lesson, we will simulate a simple database to verify values, and the topic of the subsequent lesson will be about custom constraints. And as always, lesson assignments. At the conclusion of each lesson, I highly encourage you to complete the assignments, as they will greatly contribute to your progress in ESP.NET Core 7. By consistently practicing, you will see faster results in your learning journey. And the assignments answers you can download from the GitHub, the link is below. Thanks for joining. If you have any questions or need further assistance, feel free to comment below. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more great coding content. Stay updated with the latest videos by ringing the notification bell. Happy coding!